Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us again today. My name is Katalina Pei, and I work for the and capability team here uh, at Mercer in Melbourne, in the Melbourne team. At the moment, obviously, we're all, um, we're all at home, so not out of the office. Um, it's great to have you all on board again uh, for one of these uh, webinars that is really part of a series of webinars, as some of you may know. You might have already joined a couple of those over the last few weeks. And the series of webinars was very much focused on the new shape of work, uh, and more importantly, on some really relevant uh, topics and questions that clients have come to us with, uh, with a view to really learn um, and understand how they can adapt their workforce and their workplace to the new realities of the world that we currently live in as a result of, obviously, a pandemic that has really shifted and changed the way we tend to do things over the last six months. Now, before I introduce our panels and before we kick off the conversation of today, let me take a moment to do an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today and would like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, it's probably fair to say that the last six months have been an absolute whirlwind for us all. I'm sure for everyone here on the call, for the businesses, for our families, for our friends, and it really hasn't left any country in the world untouched. So we've gone through massive challenges, we've gone through massive changes. And obviously also in a business context, it's meant that organizations have had to adapt, have had to change, and really even those organizations that put very rigorous plans in place, they were only really able to sort of sustain and successfully propel themselves for the future by pivoting and focusing on their flexibility, their adaptability and their de determination in many ways to really push forward um, and think differently about how to position and how to organize their organizations. Lots of organizations have faced different type of challenges. Um, and the good thing about hindsight and the good thing about looking back at those challenges is that we can learn from them. And that's essentially what we're here for today, is to reflect on what's been on the last couple of, uh, couple of months, six months, uh, I believe it's, it's coming up to now, and really to understand from those reflections and from those learnings, what we can do to set ourselves up for a new, successful, and hopefully brighter future to come. We're very excited that we are joined here today by two of Australia's iconic organizations, Evolution Mining and Tap Corp. Uh, and we're absolutely delighted to have two speakers um, on our panel today, Paul Eagle from Evolution Mining and Sue van der Merwe from uh, TEPCorp, who are going to share with us how their organizations have gone through the last uh, six or so months, what they've learned from it, what are some of the key reflections, and more importantly, how those collective learnings are really going to shape how they are setting themselves up for the future. So let me start by introducing our panel members for today. Paul from Evolution Mining, welcome, and thanks again for making the time today. Paul is the Vice President for People and Culture and part of the Evolution Mining leadership team. For those of you who are not familiar with the organization, Evolution Mining is the leading gold-focused Australian gold miner, operating five wholly owned mines, four of which are in Australia, and one recently acquired in Ontario, Canada. Paul is accountable for all areas of HR and people and culture, and also responsible as an executive for being a whole of business leader. Paul has operated at senior levels across a range of industries, including FMCG, finance, industrial services, and mining, obviously, and has successfully driven and implemented strategic and innovative business solutions. His experience spans several countries and several continents, including Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom and parts of Europe in both business management and people and culture and human resource roles. Paul has a very high level of expertise across the full spectrum um, of uh, human resource, human resource um, priorities, and he really prides himself on delivering tangible value to the business through the alignment of the PNC strategy to the business strategy, through building high performing teams and fit for purpose solutions. Being a Kiwi himself, he's a very avid All Black supporter. He's married with four kids and enjoys his walks along the beach, gym workouts, and spending time in great restaurants. 
which luckily you're still um, able to enjoy over in Sydney. Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Sue van der Merwe. Uh, Sue van der Merwe is the Managing Director for Lotteries and Kino at Tapcorp, an Essex-listed diversified gambling entertainment group. Sue's business, business experience spends more than 35 years. During which time, she has held various senior leadership roles. She's passionate about lotteries and has played a central role in the successful development and privatization of the Australian industry over decades. Today, she is responsible for one of, for one of the most complex multi jurisdictional lottery operations in the world, conducted under a complex regulatory regime, distributed through one of Australia's largest franchise networks, as well as successful digital channels, and with annual revenues of more than $2.8 billion. Sue is also chairman of the Asia Pacific Lottery Association, sits on the World Lottery Association Executive Committee, and was inducted into the Global PGRI Lottery Industry Hall of Fame in 2016, recognizing her contribution to world lottery excellence and integrity. At a personal level, Shu loves to explore the world and closer to home, the beautiful Sunshine Coast beaches are her favorite choice. She has two grown-up daughters and says that out of all the things that she has done in her life, that is what she's most proud of. So thanks again, Sue and Paul, for making your time available to be here with us today. Um, we're very excited to hear what you've got to share for our audience. And of course, last but not least, we're joined here by my beautiful colleague, Maria. Both Maria Leski and myself work in the talent and capability space at Mercer and have had the pleasure of partnering with both Sue and Paul over a number of years now in lots of different types of capacities. Now, as mentioned, we're going to spend some time on learning from the past, from Paul and Sue, what they've experienced, what they've gone through, and how they have used that learning and used the reflections to really understand how to change and adapt things for the future. We've got quite a number of questions that we would like to ask them today, but we will leave some time for you as the audience to also plot some questions down in the Q&A um, functionality of Zoom. Time allowing, we will refer it back to your questions towards the end of the session today um, to ensure that we can, um, we can respond to some of the things that are really top of mind for you. So by all means, feel free as we move through the session today um, to plot in some of the questions in that, um, in that Q&A section. And with that, I'll move into the first couple of questions for the day. Um, starting with Paul, welcome again, Paul. Um, would you be able to give us a little bit more background around evolution mining and more importantly, what you have seen the recent impact from the pandemic to be on your business uh, and on evolution mining as a whole? Great. Thanks, Carolina. Um, great to be here. Appreciate the opportunity and um, looking forward to discussing some of those aspects. So evolution mining, uh, ASX listed uh, company. When I joined the company eight years ago, uh, the company was only about eight or nine months old at that stage. So very early startup uh, stage. Um, we've got assets as you talked about in Australia and also Canada. When the company was formed back in 2011, um, the company had a market cap then of about $100 million. If you look at it today, it's $10 billion. So it's been a significant, I suppose, growth and, and change through that time. So it's been really good to be part of that. Uh, we've got mines that are both residential where employees get to go home each night and those that are, are fly and fly out where the employees may be at site for say seven or eight days and then they go home after that. So um, we, as you alluded to, recently acquired an asset in Ontario, Canada. So that's our first sort of venture offshore and certainly uh, acquiring that and announcing that at the back end of last year and then working through COVID, uh, trying to create some change and, and work with them remotely has, has certainly been a real challenge. So. Um, Looking forward to talking a little bit more about that. Um, but in terms of overall as a business, I think we've been very fortunate that we've been deemed to be a, uh, an essential service business. Uh, so by and large, uh, at a macro level, we've been able to continue our business in a, um, in a fairly sort of steady state without too much interruption. Uh, so we, we're very fortunate in that way. I think the biggest impact for us has been how we do business and how we operate. So we look at it at a site level, uh, obviously adhering to all the different protocols, but just doing some things differently. So a typical pre-start meeting in the morning where you've got a bunch of people in a room and you're sort of setting up the day is actually doing that differently. Differently. So either doing that outside, spacing that across rooms, uh, making sure, for example, in vehicles on site, you've only got two people, you know, one in the front, one in the back, 
Uh, and from a FIFO point of view, so fly and fly out sites, what we've done is extended the rosters so that people are um, you know, spending less time sort of traveling, there's less movement of people to make sure that we're managing that well. And also the other thing we're doing in local communities is looking to support the local community. So those individuals in local communities within which we operate that have lost their jobs, uh, we've been offering them temporary accommodation to try and uh, you know, help them with that and help the local communities. We're also starting to share employees across sites. So given some of the border closures, uh, we've got sites uh, positioned around Australia. So we've been able to share some of those employees and then the most recent thing we're doing is actually looking, uh, working with other businesses to go, well, if we've got someone isolated in Victoria, for example, we don't have a mine site there, but there's, is there a business we can partner with where they can do some meaningful work for them and vice versa? They may have some employees that are stuck in Queensland where we've got a mine site uh, where we can, we can help them out in that way. Um, I think the biggest challenge for us has really been around the Red Lake uh, asset uh, acquisition that we did in Ontario, Canada. Um, we've... It's a really important phase for us through the two to, two to, year, two to three year transition uh, and turnaround. And so what we've been doing, I think remotely largely is creating significant change. So we've reduced the site leadership team by 40%, we've reduced the workforce by 30%. We've made a bunch of other changes and we've done a lot of that sort of virtually. So, you know, if you had to said pre COVID, uh, that's the way you're gonna do it. We would have said, look, you're joking. You have to be on the ground. That's the only way it can be done. Uh, but we've been able to do that. And I think fairly effectively as well. Um, Culturally, uh, we're a very relationship-based um, culture. And I think that's the thing that's really challenged the degree of connection we've been able to have with our employees, particularly in the Sydney office, we've got around about 100 employees. Um, being able to connect with them in different ways, I think has been a, a real challenge for us. But it's been amazing how people adapt, how people adapt to the new world. Uh, and really pleasing to see that they've, um, you know, people are still getting stuff done finding innovative ways to connect um, and that's really been a, um, a learning for us. Great. Well, uh, I mean even, even for, a, for a business like yourselves as you said limited impact in terms of business continuity but still challenged in some other ways from a cultural level connecting with colleagues etc. Um, so even though you have been able to continue as an essential business operating as you have in the past has there been any particular changes around uh, your business strategy, around uh, priorities, strategic priorities moving forward? Uh, and I guess at the same time, has the board shifted what it's expecting the organization to focus on differently now? Yeah, look, good question. I think the strategy remains the same. We always take a longer term view on the strategy. Um, obviously paying attention to the, the market conditions and adapting to that, but so strategy pretty much has remained the same in terms of size of business, where we want to operate, what we're trying to do, delivering value to our shareholders, all of that's remained the same. What has changed, I think, is how we're going about that. So one of the things we talk a lot about in our business is making sure that we're constantly upweighting the, um, the quality of the portfolio of our assets. So we, with the acquisition of Red Lake uh, over in Ontario, Canada, reassessed our portfolio and realised there was an asset in our portfolio in Queensland that probably didn't fit anymore. Um, we had started a sales process and then when COVID hit, we actually put that on hold. And then we said, well, how do we make this happen in a, in a different and innovative way uh, while we're sort of trying to stay too, true, to, true to our strategy? So what we did is we actually um, continued on with that sales process. We ended up selling that asset and doing that whole thing virtually. So I think it's definitely the first time that we've done that. And I think it's the first time probably in Australia that an asset's been sold like that without the uh, potential buyers going to site and viewing the asset. Um, so I think it was just a, uh, it just showed us that, you know, you, you can do things in different ways. And if you challenge yourself and test yourself, you can actually still make some of those things happen. I think the other thing that's been a big focus for us is information. Uh, the flow and frequency of information has definitely gone up. Uh, given, um, given COVID, given the, you know, daily changes, given the restrictions and some of the, uh, the protocols we've got to adhere to. So, I think that's been a, a key change. The other thing that we're starting to think a little bit differently now around, you know, the new world of working, a lot of people working remotely. I think we've seen the shift globally where a number of companies have come out and said, hey, we've realized now that actually having our employees work remotely can be really effective. Uh, and we want to do that moving forward. So I think what that does is it opens up the talent pool to say, well, how can we think differently about our business? How can we tap into talent globally as opposed to maybe just in Australia and Canada? So that's part of the thinking process at the moment. The board, in terms of the board, um, 
Interesting, uh, I think it's been a challenge with, uh, from a technology point of view, we had a board, we've had board meetings this week. Uh, really interesting connecting in from the US, Canada, across you know, Australia as well. Um, some of the bandwidth, I suppose, on their um, connections has been good. Some of it's been pretty poor. So, you know, you get people dropping in and out. Uh, you get people sitting there in their t-shirt through to people sitting there in their suits. Um, so variations on that, some having their dinner because it's uh, late at night versus early in the morning. So that's been interesting. Um, but they've been really keen to understand the people impact, uh, how we're looking after people, um, what's happening with our people. Uh, but also from a, a business more generally and a, and a financial point of view is wanting to make sure that we stress test our balance sheet. So what they've, we've done internally is really looked at a bunch of scenarios from what if we had to stand down one of our mine sites? What if we had to close our whole business and put it on care and maintenance? What would that do to our balance sheet? So that's been a really key focus for them. And I think it's shown, shown them and given them confidence that we've got strength in the balance sheet and whatever scenario thrown at us, uh, we're in pretty good shape to, uh, to handle that. Yeah, fantastic. Interesting what you said there around the, the, the working from home and the flexibility piece, um, because in many ways it sort of accelerated the way that we thought we would be working maybe 10, 15 years from now. Uh, and many organizations weren't quite ready for that yet, have been pushed into being ready. And actually you're now understanding that there's lots of value and lots of positives in that way of working too. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Paul. Now, moving towards so obviously very different type of organization and as a result, no doubt very different challenges that you've experienced throughout this time. Um, can you share a little bit more when, the, when COVID first hit and then particularly here in Australia, uh, what were some of the, the, the responses that you initially saw happening? What, are, what were some of those immediate reactions, those immediate changes that you in the organization were considering? Sure, Catalina. And um, firstly, congratulations on pronunciation of that surname. Um, it's a difficult one. <laughs> you did a fantastic job. Um, and well, good morning. Being, to being Dutch is my native language helps. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go. Um, good morning to everyone on the call as well. Uh, look, for us, and I'm going to speak more specifically about the lotteries in Kino, um, part of Tadcorp's business. For us, the safety and support of our team members was our first priority. We moved very quickly and I think led the way as a corporate in terms of moving all our teams to work remotely quite early on, um, with the exception of a small number of people who perform critical business functions that could only uh, be done from the office. So we actually went to work from home before the federal government um, requested that of, of, of all of us. Uh, fortunately, Tabcorp already had a very well entrenched flexible working policy and we invested in the technology uh, to support that. So what that meant was we could move our workforce online to work remotely in a very short time. In fact, we did that in 24 hours, which I think was a, a fantastic effort. Uh, so once we settled on, on people and, and looking after that side of it, we then immediately turned our focus to maintaining business momentum. And the objective we set ourselves was to ensure that the business was going to be in the best position to emerge from the challenging times, strengthened and, and well positioned for the future. So we had a focus not only on getting through these times, but about how we will emerge out of this time as well. Uh, that covered a wide spectrum of business continuity and scenario planning. Um, we had a particular focus on our license obligations that needed to continue to be met. And also, I think, given the breadth of impact and the uncertainty and to some extent fear that our people were dealing with, uh, we made sure that we gave clear direction and we pr prioritised what needed to be done first. And that, I think, was important for people um, in managing what was a very, through what was a very uncertain um, time. We immediately split our critical teams, so that's our lottery draw and prize payment teams, into separate rosters. We added further backup sites to conduct lottery draws. We moved our contact centre um, to remote working. Fortunately, just before COVID hit, we'd actually changed over to a cloud-based telephony um, platform for our contact centre. So that was perfect timing and lucky timing. Um, you know, we've reviewed all our marketing material. We've adjusted it to be appropriate to social expectations around social distancing. So the team had to really pivot and um, change some of the business strategy quite quickly. Um, but having said that, similar to Paul, um, really we've, we've been able to keep going with our, our strategy because it likewise has you know, a long-term um, view. Uh, we've undertaken extensive stakeholder engagement, including supporting our retailers with information and tools, 
uh, worked very closely with government regulators and media partners to ensure that the conduct of our lottery draws can continue and is done safely uh, with our people's safety in mind. Um, and finally, I'm proud to say we decided to uphold what's been a long-standing commitment as a lottery to give back to the community. And we provided a $1 million contribution from our Golden Casket, which is our Queensland-based lottery, unclaimed prize money, um, to the University of Queensland's research into COVID-19. And that team, I'm sure you, uh, many on the call, have read about and heard about is considered to be amongst the world's best at a chance of finding um, a vaccine. And in fact, the vaccine that they've developed has now entered early human trials, which, you know, it's fantastic that as a, a lottery organisation, we were able to get behind that and, and contribute in some way to hopefully bringing us all out of this challenging time. So I think in summary, we've responded very well given unprecedented circumstances. I think a lot of the policies and the business continuity planning we had in place um, stood us in good stead, but we still had to, nobody anticipated a uh, an incident uh, of this sort of nature. So we, we had to quickly review those, add in, um, you know, additional responses and continue just to learn and adapt. And we continue to do that today as Victoria has gone into the situation, you know, that it has. Yeah, unfortunately, huh? Thank you so much, um, Sue. And uh, you touched on a couple of things there. Um, obviously, the last few months have posed immense challenges for, for leaders and leadership teams in particular around how to communicate, what to do, how to shift. Um, question for you there, Paul. In, in terms of what you've observed around you from the people you work with, your leaders in the organization, what are some of the positive shifts that you've seen happening? And I guess then the downside of that in what areas were you a little bit disappointed in terms of what would you have liked to see them do differently? Yeah, look, I think it's it's definitely in terms of the positives. I think it's definitely tested our culture and, and how we operate. I mean, one of the things we talk a lot about is wanting to be adaptive. I think what it's shown is actually we have a very adaptive culture, similar to what Sue was saying. People have moved quickly. People have mobilised to do some things differently. Uh, the information flow has been strong. Um, and people have really, I think, um, demonstrated that look, they want to do the right thing, they want to keep contributing, uh, and they've adapted really quickly. I think what it's also done, you referenced, you know, it's almost like a forced trial of what does this new way of working look like? And I think it's really challenged what I've seen in our business, a number of leaders around their paradigms around working from home or working remotely or working anywhere, uh, that actually it can work. Um, I'll just put, try and get the light back on, hang on. There we go. Um, so I think it's, it's actually been a really good uh, trial for us to go, those leaders that were thinking, well, if people are working remotely or from home, are they doing the right thing? Can they be trusted? It's actually shown that, you know, if you've got a high degree of trust with your employees, which we have, you've got clarity around what needs to be delivered, then 99.9% .9 of the population are going to do the right thing. So that's been really useful, I think, to break those paradigms and to get us thinking about, you know, different ways of working and different ways of collaborating. Um, I think the, the other thing I've seen from a real positive is just people are looking at different ways from engaging. I think very early on from March, uh, you know, teams were coming up with different innovative ways to go, well, how do we connect? How do we share more of the whole person as opposed to the business person? So in our team, for example, someone uh, came up with the idea of why don't we just pick one person, nominate a person a day, and they can share what their world is like at home. So everything from your workstation to whether you've got a cat or dog, uh, you know, what, what your place looks like, what you tend to do during the day, and share that in a visual form as well. So I think that just connected people with the broader yes. person and the holistic person as opposed to just the business person. Um, and I think I've seen a real care factor. I mean, people uh, are very cognizant of the fact that everyone's, you know, different in different situations. Some may be working from home where they're in a studio apartment with three other flatmates, and, you know, it's very difficult to get things done. Uh, as I found in my household, you know, at the beginning of COVID, having a bunch of kids in the house as well and trying to, you know, differentiate between, you know, what's workspace, what's not, and people walking in half naked into the, into meetings and stuff has, uh, has been interesting. Um, on the, I wouldn't say there's any real disappointments, but I think um, uh, what, what has been interesting is that given our relationship-based culture and we love to connect as much as we can, it's definitely been times where I've felt that actually not having the meeting face-to-face, -face, being in the room, being able to read the body language, have the ad hoc conversations in the breaks, has, has been a little bit of a downside. But it's just forced us to go, well, how do we do that in a virtual world, which is, which is definitely mm. challenging. Mm. 
And, and uh, an additional question on that, Paul, was there anything that you feel you've had to change personally yourself? That yeah, you found look, yourself not doing before that suddenly you now need to do? Yeah, look, I think uh, using this whole format uh, to the extent that we have done. So given you're not in the room and you can't have the ad hoc conversations, those sorts of things, it's been a learning around, well, how do you use the technology effectively? We've had a couple of different platforms that we've used. We've now narrowed that down to one. So even just learning some of the functionality in there, how you use the chat room, you know, putting your hand up if you want to talk, uh, but also trying to find a way to give people a voice. Uh, what I found in a number of meetings initially, particularly is that, you know, you're talking over each other, it's hard to get in. Um, so how do you create a, an environment where, you know, you're, you're checking in with people, you're giving people advice, voice, particularly some of the quieter ones. So that's been a new learning for me. Um, I think the other one is, trying to maintain effectively using my time. So definitely the email traffic's gone up, definitely the number of meetings has gone up. Uh, being able to connect with people and find them sometimes can be a little bit more difficult than walking down the hallway and chatting to someone in the office. So I think being you know, really clear around how I'm using my time effectively as a leader and making sure that people have uh, you know, connection uh, has been a challenge. Yeah, great, thank you, Paul. Um, and so what's it been like for you? What, what, what did you experience to be the greatest benefit of what you've learned and at the same time one of the greatest challenges that you've had to overcome over the last few months? Yeah, I think understandably, um, look, my, the team and, and I have had a lot more focus on contingency planning, um, that constantly updating and adapting those plans and, and that's allowed faster decision making for us. But uh, for us as a business, we've actually um, continued to have great momentum through this time. So um, except for the Kino part of our business where licensed venues um, closed and therefore we had to stand people down in that part of the business, um, the lottery part of, of my business has actually um, done very well. So for us, um, on top of that normal pace of work, we've also, as Paul was saying, we've had you know, extra, <laughs> much greater number of meetings um, and, and a lot more of that contingency planning to do. So that's been challenging, I think, um, for the team. But that's been important as well for us to, to have that regular communication and we've certainly committed um, to that. We've had greater collaboration, I think, across the overall organisation. Um, we've had more regular feedback mechanisms. We've done at least four employee pulse surveys um, in, during the time and we've used that feedback to inform our response through, um, through the whole of the five, six months and we're continuing to do that. We just did our most recent um, employee pulse survey uh, last week and that's helping us inform our response to how we might bring people back into the office when that time comes. Um, there's definitely been a demand for the latest up-to-date information um, about how our business is performing, our customers, our retailers, uh, through to feeding that through to the executive um, level, my colleagues and then through to the board. Uh, I think similar to Paul, it's been nice for us to see colleagues and leaders in that different context with everybody, you know, juggling working from home, some homeschooling children, the occasional parents of um, pets. Uh, my, my cat, Charlie, uh, wandered across the screen in the middle of one of our executive meetings and, um, you know, that was interesting, but the, the team just embraced it so well and, and you know, gave them a, a good welcome to the new member of the executive team. So I'm sure we've all had our moments and I think that's been a real positive through this time because we have seen that human element uh, that we miss when we're not seeing each other face to face. Um, but it goes even further than that because it's giving us a little peek into each other's personal lives and that's probably an, an something more than we would usually get when we're in the office together. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much, Sue. Lots of reflections, lots of learnings and, and in many ways hindsight is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Um, it really helps us understand what we can change, what we can adapt um, for the future. And so we'll spend the next 20 minutes or so focusing on based on what you've experienced and learned, what does that now mean for um, hopefully a bright future to come? And with that, I will hand over to my colleague, Maria. Thank you. And uh, as you might hear in the background that my uh, dog is completely on point, has decided to start barking just as I take over the facilitation. Um, Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I will try and mute while you're speaking, but I really can't control as she's upstairs. So on that note, as Kat said, you know, we've spent some time really, you know, looking back, I guess, and um, uh, reflecting on the past. 
So let's sort of, you know, move the conversation now and frame it in terms of the future moving forward. Uh, Sue, I guess I'll address the first question to you in terms of, you know, do you believe that the current situation or the current pandemic means that it's going to be the end of work as we know it? What's your view on that? Yeah, look, I've been keen to stress in, in meetings with my team, we, we initially started talking about when we go back to work and we actually decided to change our language around that and we said we're actually not, we are, go, we are working at the moment, it hasn't stopped and in fact we, we're working harder um, than we ever have because of what I've talked about before. So we started, you know, to change our language to say it's going back into the office. So I think that's just been an important clarification for um, us as a team. Uh, for my business, we'll always need an office, as I'm sure, you know, for others. Some of our business functions, those that we've kept in the office through this time, can't be done remotely for a whole lot of regulatory um, and security control reasons. I think online collaboration is great, but I think there's always going to be a need and a desire to bring people together physically. Uh, that value in the ad hoc conversations and those cross-team relationships that are formed outside of formal meetings and projects are just incredibly valuable to all of us and I think we all miss that a lot. Um, so I don't think it's the end of work as we know it, but I do think it will be different. You know, some companies are going to potentially downsize their office spaces. I know some companies have already made decisions to give up their office space and move completely to working um, remotely. I don't think we will be doing that, but, you know, reduced travel um, will be absolutely on the agenda. And then from the employee side, I think change will be driven by people's demands to split more time between home and office. So I think it's going to be a fascinating time as we observe what happens, because I think as restrictions have eased and cases have reduced, particularly here in Queensland, what I've seen is that it wasn't long before people were back to their old ways. So the shops were full, the restaurants were busy, and, and there wasn't much social distancing um, happening out, out in the retail um, space. So, you know, it's, it'll be fascinating to see how quickly people want to resume what they had before and, and then there'll, there'll be people who don't want to resume that. So definitely a story I think to share with the grandchildren one day, right, about <laughs> how life changed in 2020. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you talk about just the change in language. It starts to shift, you know, that mindset uh, or the way that we see things. I mean, really quite interesting. Um, so in terms of, you know, the fact that, you know, uh, these changes have taken place and will continue to take place, do you feel that, you know, Tabcorp has been able to, um, you know, really uh, manage, uh, you know, the acceleration of the changes that you've talked about? Have you been able to respond effectively and will continue uh, to respond to the future needs of that workforce? I absolutely think um, we have, and as I've spoken about before, one of the real benefits we had was the flexible um, working policy that we had in place, and we had everybody set up to work remotely. So everybody works off um, laptops. Uh, we have hot desking in the office. So people are used to uh, that sort of constant, that movement and that ability to work um, remotely and enabled us to move very quickly. Um, but, you know, the feedback that we're getting uh, is that some people are really missing the structure and the social interaction in the office and can't wait, wait to get back. Others are keen to remain working remotely now for due to safety concerns and that. So I think what's happened, though, is that our flexible work policy, whilst it was in place and it was well embedded, it wasn't, uh, the take-up was strong, but I think there were there were people in the organisation who couldn't see how they could make themselves and their job work with flexible working. And there were managers who weren't necessarily supportive of it either. And I think absolutely what this has done is sort of catapulted us a few years into than we would have otherwise been in terms of the take up of flexible um, working. And I think that's definitely going to continue. When we return, we'll be returning to 50% capacity. Um, we'll have booking of desks required. We've got a myriad of COVID safe measures um, ready to go that will be in place. So it's it's still going to feel very different for, for people and, you know, we'll support them th through that and we won't be moving our teams back to the office until we're confident that the risk of community transmission um, is very low. But I think we're very well placed. Great. 
I mean, interesting, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, flexible workplaces. We're talking about hybrid models. We're talking about, you know, greater virtual connection. Um, so there's lots of change happening now and, you know, more change coming. Uh, so, Paul, I was wondering, you know, what is this leading this new world of work, the way that we're working? What do you think are going to be the crucial leadership you know, sort of um, skills and capabilities that leaders will need to bring in order to lead that new world? Yeah, good question. Um, look, I think there's a number of things. I think first and foremost is clarity. I think clarity is absolutely important around, you know, one, what's happening externally and to Sue's point, staying up to date with the latest information and what's happening state by state and, and, and across the country. Um, I also think very importantly, communicating very clearly across the business about what's really important. I mean, for us, you know, the health and safety well-being of our employees has been absolutely number one. And we've um, made sure we've communicated that very clearly across the board. That, that's first and foremost. And then above and beyond that, I think it's about continually giving uh, people in the organisation, you know, individuals, teams and functions and so on, clarity around what's really important. It's about talking to the facts as opposed to, you know, what's hearsay. Um, and really making sure that our people are, uh, feel connected and feel like they have you know, clarity around what's, what's going on for them, as well as helping them to think about how do they maintain you know, their health and well-being, how do they maintain a you know, healthy mental state. That's definitely been a challenge through this period, and I think we've needed to adapt to help people with that. Um, so the connection piece I talked about is really important. I mean, people want to feel like they are seen and heard. So I think that's critical moving forward. Obviously, as Sue mentioned, you know, if you've got an office-based environment, for example, or you're on a mine site where you're connecting with people all the time, that's great. As soon as that changes, you're definitely going to have some people that are okay with that. You're going to have other parts of the workforce that aren't. So rather than just taking a very vanilla approach, I think it's about understanding your workforce. It's adapting to that and making sure that you're playing to those different, uh, different needs. Um, keeping a sense of calm. I think is really critical. You know, as leaders, the business will look to us to go, well, uh, what are they, how are they showing up? Uh, what's going on for them? So we talked a lot about being alert, but so, you know, staying tuned to what's unfolding, but not being too alarmed around that. Mm -hmm. so I think as a, as a leader, not like you have to have all the answers. So making sure within your network that you can reach out to people, that you can share your for you and you can seek some support as well as opposed to go on the overall leader of my function or one of the business I have to have all the answers. Um, courage, I think is critical. So being, make the call. Um, definitely, I mean, this is a very fluid situation. It's a changing situation. Everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's got different levels of comfort around, uh, you know, concerns around health and safety and so on. We've migrated or started migrating back into the office. And Sue, to your point, We've talked about, um, not about, you know, you're now coming back to work. It's about where well, you always were working. It's just there's the optionality there now to come back into the office. But some people have said, look, I don't feel comfortable traveling on public transport. I still think it's a little bit dangerous. Some are concerned about it. So we've said, great, no problems at all. You, you're enabled to work from home, you know, make that happen. Whereas others have said, look, I want to come in. I need the connection. Or actually, I'm in a studio apartment. It doesn't work for me to work from home. So make the call, uh, give the rationale, and then move forward. And then I think the other thing, as you alluded to, Sue, as well, we've got like a monthly uh, pulse survey that we do, but looking for other ways to make sure you've got a really clear feedback loop. What's working, what's not. Don't assume just because you put it in place and you think you know what's going on that's going to work. Seek the feedback, um, understand what's working, what's not, and make the change. And then I think the other thing is, uh, as a leader, is find ways to give balanced feedback to the people around you about what you see, what is working and what's not as well. Right. So again, you know, so I'd like you to add to, uh, you know, Paul's thinking. I mean, really, you know, Paul highlighted care, calm, courage, listening, and that continuous feedback through giving feedback and, and hearing for it. Is there anything else that you'd like to add in terms of the crucial skills you think leaders need to bring? Oh, I, I mean, I think one of the, the key attributes through this time has been resilience, because what we've seen is, you know, unprecedented times, uncertain times. And as Paul said, teams are looking to us uh, for that leadership for, for some certain, also for honesty, though, for us to be able to admit and say when we, you know, when we don't have the answers. 
um, and for so to be open and, and transparent and authentic um, as is you know always required to be a good leader. Uh, I think one of the just listening to Paul and thinking about our situation, we've also really put the choice in people's hands about whether they want to come back to work or not, went back to the office, I should say, getting my own language wrong. Um, and that's quite interesting because that's the first time I think that we've ever put uh, such power into our employees' hands to say, well, you get to decide whether you actually want to come back and work from the office or work from home. So even with a flexible work policy, there's probably still been more um, more constraints around uh, taking that up and, and more sort of rules around it. Whereas now we're really saying to people, we trust you, um, we want you to be comfortable working in the way that you want to work and, um, you know, we give you that that choice to make, which I think is a major shift mm. in leadership and in organisations and a really positive shift. Mm. It very much mirrors, you know, the philosophy around, you know, customer is king, listen to your customers. You know, um, you know, we've finally started to really, um, I guess, close that gap of how we've been interacting with customers now with our employees. Um, and it's great to see the acceleration that our employees are now treated like our customers and listening to their voice, which is great. I mean, you know, humility, resilience, calm, courage, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, they're a vital skills. If I was to put you both on the spot and say, you know, what is the deal breaker moving forward for leaders um, to role model, to navigate their people and, and to really shine into the future? You know, where would you put all your eggs, I guess, in which basket? What's, what's crucial from a leadership perspective? Sue? Oh, I mean, besides everything else I've said, I think, I think it's going to be listening is, is going to be a key skill because... Because people's needs and and, um, and people's wants are changing and people feel empowered uh, because of all the things we've, we've spoken about. And I think we can actually embrace that and we can come out of the other side with this highly motivated, inspired, engaged um, workforce if we choose to do that. Mm, great. Paul? Yeah, look, very similar lines. Um, uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit and take two. Um, I would say, uh, I, I think, I think. Uh, here. Yeah, that's right. Maybe, maybe I'm indecisive. Maybe that's the problem. Um, <laughs> I, I would say def definitely connection, similar to what Sue's talking about. I think making sure that people have a voice. I mean, uh, a few weeks ago, Catalina, you and I were talking about the difference between when you say, you know, to someone, "Hi, how are you doing?" In the office, what's become very clear to me is it's very easy where you ask the question because that's what you do when you when you greet someone, but are you really listening to what they say? You know, they might say, not bad, or actually I twist them a leg or whatever. Do, do you really hear that and tune into that? Whereas on this sort of format, I think you're tuned into it more. So I think really connecting with the person and truly listening to what's going on, to your point, Sue, will, will really make a difference moving forward. I think the other thing that I would say is self-leadership. I think for us as leaders to be the best version that we can and make sure that we're available in the best way for other people, we've got to do the work on the inside first. So we need to be thinking about how are we managing our mental health? How resilient are we? How are we adapting to things? And rather than just, you know, saying, well, we've just got to suck it up and move forward is really paying attention to that about what's working for us, what's not getting help if we need it. Uh, so making sure that we can then be the best version to serve those people externally that we, uh, that we do. Right, thank you. Again, just keeping a, a future focus. I mean, looking out, I'm wondering, Paul, if you can lead this in, you know, what are your top concerns moving forward? You know, your top two concerns um, as a starting point. Yeah, look, I, I would say for me, definitely more broadly, uh, the impact of COVID uh, across, I think, the whole, the country, the economy, um, I think, you know, we initially, when this kicked off, we thought, you know, three months, six months, then we're all going to get back to normal. Uh, we'll say, gee, that was an interesting period and, and we'll keep doing what we're doing. I think what we're now seeing, this is going to be around for a long time. So the flow on impacts to health has been, is a real concern for me because I think we're definitely seeing the number of people uh, that are using lifelines that are admitting themselves through, you know, due to self-harm and the likes has really spiralled. 
Uh, a lot of our younger generation are actually in that bucket as well. So that's a real concern for me about how do we, how do we help them? How do we get on top of that? I think the, the other piece is economically. I mean, we're heading towards a budget deficit of you know, $200 billion. If you had said that 12 months ago, you would have said you've got rocks in your head. That's never going to happen. Businesses are struggling. People are losing their jobs. And we're going to feel the effects of this you know, over the long term. So those are, those are real concerns for me. Sue? So? Oh, it looks similar. Um, definitely the economic um, impact and the, the flow back on that to businesses, our business, all businesses, uh, but, and also that the ongoing uncertainty. I think what I've seen and we've seen in our team in Victoria is that people are, um, they're tired now. I guess we've, we've dealt with the first wave. Uh, we felt as a country that we were coming out of it and we've done pretty well. And, and then the second wave hit Victoria and, and the feedback is that um, people in that, in that um, state are feeling, you know, more, uh, more at risk of some of the health issues that, that, that Paul was referencing. And, you know, how long does it go on for, I think, and how much can people keep dealing with and how long can we keep the additional workload going on people um, that we're seeing at the moment? Because, as I said, our business has had very good momentum um, but that's not to say there's been there hasn't been a lot of planning and work that's gone into um, keeping that momentum going through this time. Yeah, I mean such a balance, isn't isn't it? You know, we're talking about economic health and we're talking about people's health and well-being, um, and I think that's that balance that we'll be managing, you know, into into that future. You know, let's not end on that sort of. Um, <laughs> And no, you know, if there was a couple of things you're uh, optimistic about, you know, crystal balling out into the future, you know, Sue, what, what, do, what are you optimistic about? Well, I'm, I'm optimistic about our business for a start. Um, you know, I think people, people love lottery products and um, certainly some of the, the research feedback that, we, that we're getting is that, um, you know, people are looking for that optimism and that hope in times like this that they're referring to as flat, um, flat times. And so I'm very optimistic still about, you know, our business. I'm optimistic about our people because what they've shown is real resilience. Um, the way they've stepped up, um, they've managed things, they've created new ways of doing things that connected with one another. There's been some fantastic examples. And so, uh, you know, I'm really proud of the way our teams responded and I'm certainly very optimistic about the fact that we'll continue um, to respond like that and that our brands will continue to stand um, for that beacon of positivity in this in this time. Right. Paul? Yeah, I think similar to Sue, definitely the business, the people are very optimistic around that. I mean, they've shown, to Sue's point, you know, they, they, they can adapt. Um, they're very committed. They're doing great things. So very optimistic around that. I think the second thing is, uh, I believe, you know, we're, we're going to come out of this. It, it's tough. It's going to be here for some time. We will come out of it. I mean, I, I think we, when we look, uh, you know, internationally and, and the US and Europe and places like that, we live in a great country. I think overall our government's done a pretty good job of managing through something which is completely foreign to us. It's never happened before. The other thing I'm optimistic around is, you know, the Australian culture and people are very resilient. So we'll, we'll, we'll come through this. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. <laughs> Kat, I might hand over to you and see if we've got some Q&As coming in. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's, um, it's always a nicer sort of point to, to start rounding that is with the optimistic and the, and the positive things as opposed to um, uh, sort of the challenges. Now, we do have one question that came through to the uh, Q&A inbox. And I think, Paul, you've already referred to it in some ways around um, the, the, the priorities always with the health and safety of your employees. And obviously, whilst we were needing to do that in the pure context of, of the virus itself, there's obviously that secondary health issue, um, which is the mental impact of this scenario on your employees. So um, have you experienced anything around that, particularly in your organization? And, and if so, what some of the thinking around that, what, what, what are some of the strategies you might be putting in place to deal with that? Yeah, we definitely have. And I think the approach we've taken is, is hitting it from a few different angles. One is um, providing a fair bit of information upfront and continually around, 
you know, how do you manage, how do you manage your mental health? How do you make sure if you're working from home that you're developing some positive daily habits, whether that's, you know, the uh, finding a clear balance between, you know, work and personal, making sure you get outside and get some fresh air each day, having a healthy diet, getting a bit of exercise, all those sorts of things we've been actually, you know, communicating on a regular basis and doing that in different ways so that people can connect with it either in a, a verbal way, written way or, or video form. We've also got a company called Healthy Business that we've been working with for quite some time. So they've done everything from making sure that, you know, the ergonomic setup at home is, is correct for your office and how you're sitting and how you're going about your work through to uh, being there 24 seven for people that they can pick up the phone or they can do a video call and say, Hey, I'm struggling a bit here. Uh, this is not working for me. That's not working for me. So we've, we've done that as well. Um, we've got our EAP you know, employee assistance program that we've got. Um, and so we're just, and also at an individual level, we're making sure that leaders are checking in with their people on a regular basis. We're having uh, weekly conversations and just going, look, who, who are we seeing at risk? Who are we concerned about? Who lives at home on their own versus, you know, as part of a family unit or what have you? So we're really trying to make sure we put a lot of focus and energy into that. And I think that's making a difference. Yeah, thank you, Paul. So is there anything in addition to that that, um, that TAPCOP is considering in terms of mental health impacts? Oh, um, similarly, we've got an employee assistance program and we've always had that. Um, where, where employees can receive mental you know, health and wellness assistance. But we've obviously been promoting it much more heavily through this time than, than we usually do. We also make that available to, um, for people's direct family members because I think that's important to recognise as well that you know, people are living in situations um, where they've been impacted by people around them and their own mental health as well. So besides that, I think just that regular communication has been very important and, and what we've been doing is making sure that we we've increased the frequency and format of communication you know email Skype calls video podcasts the whole lot um, we've led from the top and I think that's been really important um, the board actually started having um, weekly sort of update meetings in the first um, in the first couple of months the executive leadership team we initially instigated first thing in the day meetings on Monday Wednesday Friday um, my leadership team and I met daily for the first um, few weeks and then as time's gone on, we've adjusted that frequency according to need. Um, what we've been talking to people about is, is um, with the wins that we're having in the business and this has been a little bit difficult because we've had this situation where we've had some people in the business stood down and not having work and we've had other parts of the business doing really, really well. And I think what I've been focused on is being empathetic and balanced in that communication because we want to celebrate those wins and we want even the people who have been stood down to feel a part of that celebration because in the end, one part of the business performing um, well or two or three parts of the business performing well means that as an overall business, you know, we come out of this um, stronger and that's to everybody's um, benefit. So uh, definitely the communication and then the um, the, the offer of the assistance program to to people and their family members yeah great thank you sue now in terms of i'm, I'm um, i can see that we're uh, coming close towards the the end of the webinar today but um a, a sort of some final thoughts and comments from from both yourself sue and paul um uh, we said at the beginning, look, no one could have foreseen, even the greatest minds in the world could not have foreseen this coming and certainly wouldn't have known how to prepare for it. Um, and hindsight is a great thing. So looking back on what we know today and with the benefit of hindsight, is there anything that you would have done differently? Uh, any takeaway you want to leave the audience with that if you could and you could reset the time that you would approach differently? Maybe Paul, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, look, you're right. If we had known what was coming five months ago, uh, hindsight's a beautiful thing. Um, look, I think for our business, we would have definitely uh, made sure earlier on that we gave people uh, breaks and, 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 and some leave. I think it's been a pretty intense period. And then when we've gone through, you know, more lockdowns and uh, border closures and so on, even if people want to take breaks now, it's like, well, where do I go other than stay at home? Um, I think definitely uh, more capability building around how do you use the tools effectively, particularly these virtual tools that we're using. I mean, that's been a steep learning curve. Um, I think uh, the healthy, you know, healthy mind piece and mental mental health has been really important. So I think we would have put more focus into that up front, you know, around resilience, around thinking about 
if your change, if your work environment changes, your work hours are changing, and so on, with our Canadian asset, you know, how do you deal with some of that stuff? So, getting people ready for that. I think the other thing is realizing that you know when this first came out, we were hearing three to six months. Um, so, I think you know, using an analogy of you know, we thought initially it might be a two hundred or four hundred meter sprint. What we're now realizing it's a marathon. So, you know, started out strong with sharing lots of information, connecting people, making sure people knew what they were doing. I think, you know, how do you maintain that through, that momentum through over a long period uh, has been a challenge. Um, The one thing I would leave people with, I think, you know, in this time and moving forward is uh, in this, you know, period of significant change, connection is paramount. So connecting with people, making sure they know they matter, not only as an individual in the business, but as an individual full stop, giving them a voice, making sure they're seen and heard. I think that connection is critical. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul. And great takeaways um, to leave the audience with. How about you, Sue? Um, oh, look, I have to say on a personal level, um, you know, I would have set myself up a better home office and maybe a home gym before all that equipment um, sold out. But no, look, on a serious note, I think um, I think we were, we were very well placed, as I, as I talked about before, uh, with our flexible working policy. Our, our technology teams were actually watching the situation very carefully from early January and they were ready to roll out that remote working um, very quickly and bring everyone up to, to speed. Uh, our business continuity plans were in, in place and that perform, you know formed a good um, starting point. But again, obviously, we never contemplated a situation like we were facing. Uh, it was good that we had that planning as a base and that, that really did stand us in good stead for responding. Um, but, but like Paul said, I think one of the biggest challenges has been the constant uncertainty. Um, you know, usually when you're dealing with a business business interruption, you sort of know it's done and you know what you're facing. Um, this is constantly changing um, and we never know when it's going to end and that's that's a very, very challenging situation for us as leaders and for our people as well. Uh, but that's that's what it is. So, you know, I guess we, we wouldn't have known that five months ago. Uh, we probably will have situations in the future um, where we faced with similar similar challenges. So that just means building all of that that strong culture um, and those strong attributes in our leaders and our people in terms of everything we've talked about, resilience, adaptability, etc., is uh, really really important. Um, and us and for me, I guess one takeaway I would leave is is that willingness to empower and trust our people to listen and embrace flexible working. It's it's a fundamental requirement, I think, now for a successful um, leader. There, there is and will continue to be a new expectation from our teams and successful businesses, I think, will be those that embrace, embrace all of that because we are, you know, after all, nothing without a highly motivated team of people. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sue. And that's a, a beautiful note to sort of start drawing the session today uh, to a close. Um, thank you all for our attendees for joining the insightful conversation today. Um, we've heard lots of very interesting things from Paul and Sue, and hopefully you were either able to take some of those learnings away with you into your workplace, or at least relate to some of the challenges that um, every organization is facing at the moment, and that really at the same time creates a fantastic platform to start rethinking some of the ways we're going to do things in the future. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the session, this was actually part of a series of webinars. And so I'd like to remind you that our next webinar is coming up on the 27th of August. And we'll be focusing on how COVID-19 has changed the employee experience. Today, we've obviously been talking more around the leadership aspect and, and hearing from, from two executive leaders around their experiences. The next webinar is going to focus more on how have um, staff an employee more broadly in the organization experienced this period of time. Um, we will share the link to pre-register to this event uh, over the coming days. And then of course, last but not least, I would like to thank to our two panel members today for making their time and their effort available, um, for being so open and honest and forthcoming in, in, in terms of what you've experienced, what your organizations have been going through. Uh, and I'm, sh- I'm sure that everyone would agree with me that it's been a very um, fruitful and a very insightful um, and engaging conversation. So thank you so much. And I know that you're both extremely busy, especially during these times. Uh, so very much appreciating your uh, your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.